Hi, my name is Dr. Catherine Hughes. First of all, many thanks to DJ Anthracide on YouTube who suggested this person for today's analysis. I do kind of want to say that in a deep American accent. DJ Anthracide. <laughs> Anyway, I've done a number of psychological analyses in the past and I draw on several different subjects such as psychology, um, sociology, criminology. I draw on available research findings to give an informed opinion of what an offender's behaviour can tell us about their psychology. In this particular video, I'm going to be discussing Arthur Shawcross, who is also known as the Ginny's River Killer. In all of my videos, I do try to focus more on the psychology of the behaviour. However, it is sometimes necessary to include some details to give you an overall understanding. Therefore, this video does contain some details of rape, sexual assault and murder of children, arson, murder and mutilation of women, necrophilia, and complex psychiatric conditions. First of all, I'm going to give you a brief overview of the case and the, of the offender. Then I'm going to talk about the upbringing of the offender, because I have found in the past that this can sometimes offer very valuable insights to their behaviour. Then I'll discuss the behaviours during the crime that reveal psychological aspects of the offender, as well as any psychiatric or mental illnesses that they've been diagnosed with. If you do want to learn more about the psychology of crime and criminal behaviour and offender profiling, there are a range of courses, online courses available via my website and there is a link to my website in the description box below. Some of them are free, some of them you pay for, but you do get a money back guarantee. I spend a lot of hours fact checking and cross checking information for details of the crime and of the offender that I'm doing a particular analysis on and sometimes there are masses and masses of information to go through and of course this case is no different. The difference with this case is that Arthur Shawcross is a pathological liar and has been known to change his version of events depending on who's interviewing him at the time. Now this means that I can't always be 100% certain whether the information that I'm presenting to you is fact or fiction. If you've closely examined the case before and I talk about details that are untrue or different to what you've heard, you know the reason behind it. The main overall facts of the case are consistent but there might be small details so please forgive me for that and do bear that in mind as you watch this video. Arthur Shawcross was born in 1945 and in 1968 at the age of 22 he was jailed for arson and he served two years of a five-year sentence. Shawcross's first known murders were in 1972 when he killed a young boy and a young girl in Watertown in the USA. In 1972 Shawcross lured a 10-year-old boy called Jack Blake into some woods where he sexually assaulted him and then killed him. Shawcross was known to the family and he, because he'd taken Jack on fishing trips in the past. Around the same time, he raped and killed eight-year-old Karen Ann Hill, who was visiting Watertown with her mum. After Karen's body was found, they proposed a plea deal to Shawcross, whereby he'd tell them where Jack's body was and he would only be charged with manslaughter for one child. Other sources say that it was a telephone tip-off. That led to the body um, of Jack being found though. Shawcross was sentenced to 25 years in prison but only served 15 years when he for the murder of the two children in 1972. Once he was released Arthur Shawcross continued to murder. The short version of what happened is that he killed 11 women who were mostly sex workers. I will talk more about the crimes later, but he was sentenced to life imprisonment and he died while he was in prison. Shawcross was born in Maine in the USA in 1945 and he's the eldest of four children. He's said that his mother was domineering and his relationship with his father wasn't much better. Intelligence tests that were carried out during his early school years put his IQ at around 86, which is below average. He claims that he exhibited behavioural problems at an early age, including bedwetting and bullying. School records of him show that he would often play truant from school and had a tendency to bully other people, other children and be violent. He dropped out of school in 1960 after failing to pass the ninth grade. 
He's claimed that his mother was, would insert foreign objects into his rectum and that his aunt performed oral sex on him when he was nine years old and that during junior high school he had sexual relationships with his sister. He's also said that he had his first homosexual encounter at the age of 11, which he says was followed by experimentation with bestiality. However, his parents and his siblings claim that none of this sexual abuse actually took place. They said that any events that he were, he described were a product of his own imagination. Nobody knows which side to believe, but as I said earlier, Shawcross has been known to change his version of events depending on who's interviewing him at the time. Shawcross went on to marry a woman and had a son with her. It, they later divorced and he gave up any rights to see that child. He'd married that first wife in September 1964. But when he received a probationary charge for unlawful entry in 1965, that marriage then split up. It was too much for it and they divorced then. I wouldn't normally include as many life details as I'm going to with this analysis. However, I feel that knowing it will really help you to understand how dysfunctional his life was. When he was 21 years old, Shawcross was drafted into the US Army in 1967, scoring above average on intelligence test. So that means that one of his IQ test scores were wrong. His early IQ test only gave him a score of 86. It is entirely possible that he didn't complete the first test to the best of his ability at the time. He served one tour of duty in Vietnam. He claims that he murdered and cannibalised two young Vietnamese girls and several children while he was there. However, there's no corroborating evidence at all to support this. He also claimed to have a combat kill of 39. But authorities claim that he wasn't serving in a combat role and he didn't kill anybody on his tour of duty. He then went on to marry a second time, but an army psychiatrist told his wife that Shawcross derived sexual enjoyment from starting fires. His wife soon divorced him and he began committing crimes such as arson and burglary. His offences earned him a five-year prison sentence. But after serving only 22 months, he was granted an early release in 1971 because of his role in the rescue of an officer during a prison riot. So far in his life, there are patterns of instability in his relationships and he has a disregard for social norms and rules. He lived a very chaotic lifestyle and he frequently offended. He varied wildly in the two IQ tests that he's known to have took. He told several different accounts of events within his life. He claimed to have been sexually abused and sexually deviant in his younger years. He claimed to have PTSD from his tour of duty, but his accounts have all been disputed. The picture that was starting to emerge for, for me is that he really didn't understand his own behaviour and he was simply looking for reasons why he was behaving the way that he did. He might very well have convinced himself that he'd gone through these traumatic events because at least then there'd be a reason for his behaviour and his mindset in his mind. He was released from prison again in October 1971 and he returned to Watertown. A year later in 1972, he claimed his first victim, who was a 10-year-old boy called Jack Blake, Sure, as I said at the beginning, Shawcross had took him out on fishing trips so the family knew him and they'd been on one of these fishing trips just a few days before he disappeared but he denied any knowledge of the disappearance. Several weeks after that, in April 1972, he married his third wife who was pregnant with his child. Jack's body wasn't found until five months after that. He'd been sexually assaulted and suffocated, but police had no leads as to the identity of the killer. On September the 2nd, he raped and killed eight-year-old Karen Ann Hill. Her body was found under a bridge and she'd been raped and murdered. Neighbours remembered that Shawcross had been seen with Karen near the bridge before her disappearance and he had a history of minor run-ins with these local children. 
Under the terms of a plea bargain that was offered to him, Shawcross was allowed to plead guilty to one charge of manslaughter for which he was given a 25-year sentence. And that plea deal was offered because there was very little evidence of his involvement in the girl's murder and police gave him this deal in exchange for the location of Jack's body. After 14 years, prison staff and social workers concluded that Arthur Shawcross was no longer dangerous. They allegedly disregarded warnings of the prison psychiatrist who'd assessed Shawcross as being a schizoid psychopath. I'll talk more about all of the diagnoses that he's received in the next section. He was released on parole in 1987. He had difficulty settling down in communities because the neighbours would protest to his presence and employers would fire him. After relocating due to the public's outcry because of his release, he moved to Rochester with his fourth wife. The judicial system thought it was wise to seal Shawcross's records to prevent public panic wherever he lived. But that then led to the murder of 12 more people, all of them in Rochester. As with his previous wives, his current marriage wasn't stimulating enough for him and he began to use the services of local prostitutes as well as having a girlfriend. In the documentary that I watched on Arthur Shawcross, he gave lengthy interviews where he spoke very candidly about the murders that he'd carried out. He said that people on the outside don't know what evil is and when he asked if he did he said somewhat. He did say that he wasn't going to go into details about how he killed his victims. He used words such as somewhat, possibly, probably, I don't know and I don't believe that for a minute. I think it's most likely that he's controlling the information that he reveals so that he's seen in a way that he wants to be seen in. He remembers each and every murder. He spent time with these women, even after death by dismemberment and mutilation. He left the victims and then returned to remove body parts. He was becoming more and more comfortable as time went on and he'd broken down all of the barriers that then allowed him to see these women as somewhat less than human and deserving of the punishment that he gave them. Most of his later victims were sex workers, but one was simply a local woman and he'd claimed that she'd stolen from him. He said that she was a friend until she started stealing stuff from his house. He claimed that he killed one victim after spending the day with her. He says that she just jumped up at the end of the day and flipped in his words. Then she started shouting and crying, saying that she was going to tell the cops on him. Throughout the investigation, of these series of murders, the police came to the conclusion that he must have been a regular sex worker user because these girls were comfortable going with the man and they'd returned safe on many different occasions so they weren't hesitant even when they knew that there was a serial killer in the area. But he was hiding in plain sight. He boasted in the TV interview that he gave. He said that he was sitting on a stoop in shiny shoes and nice clothes when a policeman came and sat down next to him saying that they were there to look for a man who'd been killing sex workers. He said that they'd point out all of the decoy prostitutes and the other people, the other officers who were on the street. He seemed quite pleased to be able to fool the police and sit there in plain sight chatting to the officers. He claimed that he murdered the Rochester prostitutes in revenge for supposedly having sex with a HIV positive prostitute. He's claimed that he would eat the body parts in order to speed up the process of death out of the assumption that he was then infected. In that same documentary, he refused to talk about the two children that he murdered. He warned the interviewer several times and said that he wasn't willing to talk about that. And I think that that's most likely because he was able to give some kind of an excuse or reason for killing the women. But the children's murders were absolutely indefensible and he knows it. The children were innocent victims that he'd raped and sexually assaulted. He knew there was no good reason that he could give 
for justifying their murders. It is human nature for us all to believe that those who murder and mutilate victims are so very different to those who don't kill people and we think that they must stand out in some way because of that. We've seen this pattern over and over again with several serial killers. It's never the dark moody character that behaves overtly different in society. It's always the church worker, the scout leader, the nice neighbour next door that nobody expects. They never come under suspicion because they're so normal. This case has been examined by several experts in the field and they've come up with a range of psychiatric and mental health conditions that might explain his behaviour. The Wikipedia page that I read insinuates that his early bedwetting is part of the McDonald triad and that's made up of three factors and the presence of any two factors are considered to be predictive of or associated with violent tendencies, particularly with relation to serial offenders. A number of researchers have claimed that there is substantial evidence for the association of these childhood patterns with later predatory behaviours and the triad links cruelty to animals, obsessions with fire setting and persistent bedwetting as at certain ages to violent behaviours, particularly homicidal behaviours and sexually predatory behaviour. However, other researchers haven't found any evidence at all to support this. When Shawcross was in his early 20s, an army psychiatrist had told his wife that he derived sexual enjoyment from starting fires. While he was in prison for the killing of the two children, a psychiatrist had assessed Shawcross as a schizoid psychopath and that condition is characterised by a lack of interest in social relationships, a tendency towards a solitary or a sheltered lifestyle, secretiveness, emotional coldness, detachment and apathy. They may be unable to form intimate attachments to others and simultaneously possess a rich and elaborate but exclusively internal fantasy world. One psychiatrist has also stated that he has antisocial personality disorder. When scores are at the extreme top end within antisocial personality disorder, they're then labelled a psychopath. There's absolutely no doubt in my mind that Arthur Shawcross is a psychopath. The most common understanding of a psychopath is someone who's skilled at lying and manipulating others. They don't have any empathy. They feel very little remorse for what they do. Although psychopaths can be quite charming, they can come across as being very friendly, quite personable, and they're at ease manipulating other people with, around them. In his trial, his defence team tried to claim mitigating circumstances for the murder of the 12 women. Shawcross pleaded not guilty to the murder of the women by reason of insanity and there was testimony from a psychiatrist called Dorothy Lewis who said that he had brain damage, multiple personality disorder which is now known as dissociative identity disorder and post-traumatic stress disorder and had been sexually abused as a child. Lewis claimed that Shawcross took on an alternate personality named Bessie when he murdered. And she argued that Shawcross should be institutionalised instead of being imprisoned. Other professionals have publicly disagreed with that diagnosis. Dr Park Diaz dismissed Lewis's diagnosis and claimed under oath that during Shawcross's trial, he felt that Lewis was inviting Shawcross to play out various roles, which in turn led to him making up Bessie. An FBI criminal profiler called Robert Ressler reviewed the PTSD claim on behalf of the prosecution before the trial. Ressler, in his report, wrote that his claim of having witnessed wartime atrocities was patently outrageous and untrue. Now, so far, we can see how all of these different diagnoses can relate to Shawcross's chaotic lifestyle and his chaotic behaviour. These conditions can't fully explain all of Shawcross's behaviour in isolation. There is likely to be a very complex interaction between conditions. But I think 
that we must remember that he's a pathological liar too. He changes details of his story depending on who he's talking to. He's made several claims about why he killed these people. I'm going to say something now that you don't hear very often from professionals. Experts always want to be able to claim why a person acts in the way that they do and why they kill in the way that they do. We all want to know what it is that makes these people into killers. Maybe it's in the hope that we can identify people like this in future. Maybe we want to know what happened in a person's life that led to them to become cold killers. We want the truth, which is, of course, probably part of the reason why you're watching this video today. So here's the truth. I don't know. I don't know what condition or conditions that Arthur Shawcross has got. There are several diagnoses that could be applied to him, but because he's not even honest with himself, how can he be truthful with those who were interviewing him to investigate why he did these things? My personal opinion is that Shawcross doesn't know himself why he did these things. He's searching for answers and making up stories that would give some kind of an explanation for his behaviour. He's a man looking back on his life and on his crimes without any understanding of how or why he did those things. There are more links below and I've left the link to the documentary in the um, video description below. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch this. I hope you found it interesting and more importantly, I hope you've learned something from it. Bye for now.